Hi, this is Laura. You often hear it said that people cannot be what they cannot see, or as one guest put it recently, we cannot build what we cannot dream. The Laura Flanders Show is all about seeing and reporting on healthier, happier ways of being, and we're dedicated to feeding the dreaming and doing of everyone, regardless of the ability to pay. But we can only do that if those who can support us do. And this fall, we're making it super easy for you to do your bit and make your contribution monthly. For as little as $3 or $5 directly off your debit or credit card every month, you can step up and become a Patreon partner. You'll receive early word about events and extras and uncuts, and you'll be keeping this programming advertising-free and available for everyone. But don't just dream about it. Do it. Make the future we want to believe in real. Sign up today at patreon.com forward slash the LF show. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com forward slash the LF show. Now on with this week's show. Hi, I'm Laura, and this is the Laura Flanders Show, a TV and radio program that shines a light on the solutions of tomorrow today. We report on the people and movements driving systemic change from the worlds of politics, arts, and entrepreneurship. Welcome. Democracy. When it works well, it scares the bejesus out of anyone or group that wants to hold power just for their own narrow self-interests. That's because democracy is supposed to be about majority rule, right? Which may be why, for as long as the United States have been in existence, the idea of democracy has been in tension with our reality which is actually a representative republic with very carefully restricted access to the vote. Those tensions came to a very obvious head for a lot of people this January 6th, when an armed insurrection sought to invade Congress to decertify a majority, won largely by newly organized voters of color. Since then, we've seen a nonstop campaign to discredit that election and democracy fairly generally, to restrict voting rights, to attack the honest teaching of history, to resist any changes to policing, let alone defunding, and to roll back self-determination rights for women and trans people. And it doesn't stop there. It is all about adapting the American electorate to authoritarianism, my friend Scott Nagagawa said kind of casually to me the other day. And that's the kind of comment that stops one in one's tracks. And it's for that reason that I invited Scott back to co-host this discussion and invite some of his colleagues. Scott Nakagawa is co-founder and senior partner of Change Lab, a national racial equity think and act lab. So Scott, to you, democracy, it, it sounds like we need a kind of national temperature check. I think our conversation started with our asking, what time is it on the clock of the world? And on the clock of democracy, the hour does appear to be very, very late. But as it is so often darkest before the dawn, democracy watchdog groups around the country are also pointing to some new and hopeful signs, perhaps a sign of a new day the rise of popular pro-democracy movements. With that in mind, I did, like you said, invite some of the best people I could think of, friends of mine, um, to help take the temperature of democracy around the world and here, especially in the United States. Um, so we have here joining us, Rachel Carmona, executive director of the Women's March, one of the largest women's organizations in the world. Um, Adrian Evans of uh, United Vision for Idaho, where she's the executive director out there in mostly rural America and Rinku Sen, Executive Director of the Narrative Initiative. So welcome everybody to the show. Thanks for joining us. So before we get to the dawn and the good news, I, I have to just start with um, where we are right now. And as September began, we were reeling from what was happening in Texas. Uh, it began this season with the nation's most restrictive voting law, the nation's most restrictive abortion ban, and a governor who seems to think that it is government overreach to distribute um, mail-in ballots um, or masks or force people to wear masks. But it is not an infringement of your freedom um, to be forced to bear an unwanted child. So, Rinku, I think I heard a rumor that you were in Texas. C can you start by telling us something about the temperature there? Is this total freeze or is this the kind of 
chill that fires up the kind of popular democracy movement that, that Scott's looking for? I live in central Texas, about 30 minutes north of Austin. And uh, along with the things that you mentioned, Laura, the other law that went into effect yesterday is the law that allows Texans to carry a firearm without a license. How could you I forget? don't even need to be licensed to carry your gun around. And um, that might be the most terrifying one for me. I would say that the mood here is one of getting ready, hunkering down. That has been going on for a long time here in Texas. I think people are probably familiar with the idea that this is the election that Texas is going to go blue. No, this is the election. It didn't happen last election. It'll going to be the next election. And um, there are many, many obstacles to Texas going blue. But there are also many drivers toward that outcome here. There are wonderful organizations. Um, there is money starting to flow into the state for de democratic organizing of all kinds, big D, little d, uh, local, regional around the state. And Rachel's here too, actually, uh, a new Texas resident. People are still moving to Texas and that's good. So what are you seeing, Rachel? What's happening over there? Well, I am in a different part of the state from Rinku, so I am in the Panhandle, um, so the reddest red um, area. I'm in Amarillo. I see a lot of different things. I see what Rinku was talking about in terms of, you know, organizing against um, the, you know, kind of encroachments onto rights. But I also see people who, um, because of misinformation and disinformation, um, believe that there is a different landscape than there is. And so I think that there's a lot of opportunity to reach, um, you know, folks who feel like are in separate communities from us or feel like they're ideologically opposed um, to us um, by virtue of having better communications and and, um, you know, clearer communications um, and, and just accurate communications, because I think that a lot of um, what drives the policy and legislation or even values and feelings um, around the these laws are actually just rooted in, in things that aren't true. Um, I know Adrian in Idaho is actually tapping in to the people who are the audience for all of that unreality and trying to find out what are you really thinking? What's really happening? Why are you making the choices you're making um, out there in conservative America? I wonder, Adrian, if you can tell us something about it. I mean, I think that we're standing at a moment, right, that is that question. Is it darkest before the dawn or before the storm? And a lot of that rests on what we're doing right now. So living in a rural state like Idaho, where we see this escalation of white nationalist activity um, and recruitment and disinformation, and this alignment toward authoritarianism and rejection of democracy, the question really has to be, what is motivating this? And so we launched a project um, you know, that really sought to answer that question. What is motivating, fueling, and driving this shift in American democracy? And so the program is gathering the largest data that has ever been collected, but it is interesting because what we are doing is we are going to the source of it. And we are asking people who are either aligned with white nationalist activity or who are susceptible to recruitment and disinformation. And we go in with one question. We all agree that our nation is more divided than it has ever been. But what is it that you believe is causing this? And from there, we are actually documenting. What is it? Is it racism? Is it sexism? Is it political and social identity? Is it a lack of faith in our democratic institutions? And where are those sources of information that folks are relying on to inform them? You said that you're going in. Can, can you talk a little bit about how you're going in? I mean, are you arriving on the doorstep? Are you phoning people up? What are you doing to take this kind of a, a temperature check, really, of people's opinion? So what we did is build a really robust texting program. Uh, and I know that may seem very inauthentic, but we really tailored the approach to keep that authenticity. So this isn't like a text you would get on your phone uh, and s ask you to do something. It's a live human being on the other end asking, what is it that you think, believe, feel? What do you care about? And what that does is allow us an extensive reach, Laura. So we are actually reaching out to 500,000 people at minimum across the country. 
We have concluded Idaho's outreach. We are in North Carolina. We are moving to Georgia. And we are going to discover, is it the same uniformly across the country? Or do we have, have nuance that we need to be aware of so that we can really reach people where they are? And what we found is that people, especially people in rural communities who are particularly susceptible, are very isolated. They're alone. There are very few opportunities to have these kinds of conversations or to know if that's a safe place. And we find that a tremendous number of people want to have these conversations. They want to be heard. 42,000 conversations, by the way. I just want to say that. 42,000 conversations and growing. And so it is really the largest data set of its kind, and it should teach us a great deal. You know, I recently heard somebody use this term, hidden tribes, to refer to the things that inform the way we behave as people that are beyond the things that you see, like that I'm an Asian person or somebody else is a white person, that inside of those groupings, there are these little hidden things that we live by, the real life that we live day to day, that, um, you know, those stories that we help to tell us, uh, that we tell ourselves to help us to understand what's happening in the world around us that is so important. And um, there seems to be some indication we have failed to tap into those stories. Rinku, you lead the narrative initiative. So um, I'm wondering if you can help us understand um, something about those stories. What is narrative and why is it important to us now? Narrative, our definition of narrative is that these are the themes and ideas that are embedded in stories. So all of the cop shows that we watch on TV and all of the Sunday night hospital dramas and all of the comic books that are popular now through those stories. And each of those stories, there is a moral and a set of ideas. So that set of ideas is what we call narrative. Um, when those ideas are repeated through many collections of stories for a long time, let's say 200 or 300 years, they become deep narrative and very, very sticky, hard to dislodge. So if we look at January 6th, you hear about the violence, you hear that it's shocking, that it's unusual. And the solution to it is heavily law enforcement. We have to find all of the uh, rioters and we have to arrest them and they're gonna get punished in the um, criminal system. So what we need to do is, uh, I think, give people clear ways to block white nationalist activity that build toward pluralistic, multiracial, local democracy. The, the answer is not law enforcement. Law enforcement is not going to put an end to white nationalist organizing. Um, the answer is another kind of organizing that actually involves everybody and um, gives them a role. This is The Laura Flanders Show. I'm Laura. We're taking a national temperature check on the state of democracy in the USA. With me this week is Scott Nakagawa. He's co-founder and senior partner of Change Lab, a national racial equity think tank. Our guests are Rinku Sen, executive director of the Narrative Initiative, Adrian Evans, executive director of United Vision for Idaho, and Rachel O'Leary Carmona, executive director of the Women's March. You can find more shows in our archives with Scott Nakagawa and some of our guests. Most recently, he was part of our panel discussion on counter the January 6th coup from the grassroots up. Go to our archives at lauraflanders.org to check that out along with all sorts of recommended extras and additional programs. Sign up for our weekly newsletter to receive information on all our streaming events and audio exclusives, including full uncut interviews and my commentaries. I call them the F word. The latest is on the complete picture of our work culture. Next, I asked Rachel O'Leary Carmona, as head of Women's March, to talk about the role of narrative and culture around women and women's rights. But first, here's Time Machine by Raoul Midon from his album, Don't Hesitate, courtesy of the artist. You can find my interview and more with Raoul in our archives. Here's Time Machine. Time to board my time machine, sir. Searching for a place I've never been before As I watched the ages flying by Wondered if I'd ever see the end of war Wondered if I'd ever see the day When the price 
price of war becomes too high to pay, yeah. And you and I can find another way. Yeah. Are to give each other what we need. Here is where I'll stay. Where I'll stay. Well, let me come to you on that, Rachel, because... It does seem to me that when it comes to women's organizing, one of the things that the Women's March has done is decentralize and and multiply, really, our stories around women and Mm -hmm. around feminism and women's rights and women's organizing. And in Mm -hmm. a sense, you've multiplied, grown bigger, our picture of what organizing by, for, with, and about women's freedom uh, is. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about the role, A, of, of narrative and culture in all of this, but also your relationship to this discussion around authoritarianism versus um, democracy, diversity. Women's March was born, you know, in, in 2017 in the aftermath of the election. And I think that the easy story to tell there is it was a protest to, to the election of Donald Trump. I think there was a much more complicated story there about um patriarchy, um, the roles that women play inside of um, families, homes, communities, society. And one of the things about Women's March that has been really effective is that people can come with the issue that's closest to their heart. We have a a big tent and and a broad way for people to get involved. What we look for is people who are committed to shared values and a shared future. Um, And we meet folks where they are. And so maybe for somebody who has limited, you know, uh, mobility, that means taking action from their house. Um, maybe that means, you know, marching and and having an opportunity in a vehicle for people to get involved in the ways that that they can, um, I think is really crucial. You know, I know that in some years there's been kind of pushback to, oh, that's just online. You know, that's just what have you. Um, and I actually just think it's going to take all of us in all of the ways um, and that we don't have the luxury of turning our nose up at any one set of tactics. I think it it just takes everything we have and all the creativity we have and all the imagination that we have to be in the space to um, actually propel propel ourselves forward into the future um, that we deserve. You are all fantastic. And I love hearing what everyone is doing. But we started by saying there is this assault on the idea of democracy being organized by authoritarians who are not loosey-goosey organizing in any way they feel like. They have playbooks, they have talking points, they have meetings, they have trainings. Is what I'm hearing tough enough for this moment? You know, is it tough enough? (laughs) Maybe not, maybe not. I mean, seriously. Um, But, you know, we got to get the practice, right? We have to toughen up and we're going to do that by taking action. And so we have to learn as we go. You know, this is something completely new. This is something we haven't tried. You know, we so easily default to polarization in the world, right? We easily say, it's your fault, it's your fault, it's your fault. And, um, you know, what we're saying here is we need to embrace the idea that maybe it's all of us. Maybe we all need to move forward together to make change happen in a positive way. If we want an inclusive society, maybe we have to be inclusive. You know, if we want a society that isn't about demonizing and denigrating each other, maybe we just need to start to stop that and look for the good. Well, maybe that's why Adrian's leading the way. You can't just abandon most of Idaho. Yeah, no, and I would say, I I don't know that the question is really, is it tough enough? I think the question is, is it strategic enough? This is about real people talking in real language in real time to understand what it is that we are facing. And yes, there are those that are very well organized. Um, Political Research Associates has documented that 35% of those who voted for Trump are really just die hard. We will never persuade them. But another 65% of the country are feeling lost and abandoned. And like a system hasn't been working for them, right? And so they're very susceptible to all of these efforts to move us toward authoritarianism. And that's where we have to step into the breach. And I would say particularly um, in regard to Rachel and the Women's March, right? It is also about finding our lane. I, I would imagine there are many viewers here today who are thinking, I understand that this is a problem, but I don't know what to do, right? And this I think is also really naming and owning what white work can look like. This is the moment for white people to step up, to have hard conversations and to really 
combat and confront what we're seeing. But to Laura's point, you know, a couple of weekends ago in Portland, Oregon, a Proud Boys rally ended up in a shootout, you know? And so those are the kinds of things that are happening for which we are not yet prepared. What is the law, non-law enforcement response to that kind of street violence on the part of people who are basically doing it while chanting, whose streets, our streets? Can our answer just be, okay, they're yours because we can't face the gunfire. What's the alternative? So we do a lot of reacting. And what, from a communication standpoint, one of the problems when we're reacting is that we almost always amplify the messages of the authoritarians when we are reacting. We're like, look how horrible this is. Um, go listen to this person be horrible. Why? We don't want to, we don't want to drive people in that direction. We want to drive them in our direction toward our content. And so there's some very fundamental basic things we can change. Number one, don't retweet the opposition. Don't do it. Um, don't share it on Facebook. Um, if you want to say something about what is happening, then try to do it in a way that doesn't repeat their phrases and talking points. These are huge things we're talking about in what feels like a super urgent moment. Has there been an experience in your life where people, where you felt, oh, we can do this. We've, we've got this. We are acting in this moment that I'm feeling as if this big we is all of ours. When you asked the question, what I thought about was not election day, but that Saturday after when the election was finally called and the country kind of <laughs> erupted into the streets. And that seems like, I mean, for me, you know, growing up, I'll be honest, like I, I was not one of those little girls that used to grow up and play like bride or kitchen. I used to play Princess Leia. So I've been leading the resistance in my mind since, you know, since I was five. Um, work. And so like this moment felt like this, like, you know, like return of the Jedi, like Endor scene of like everybody across the galaxy, like, like, ha like, you know, celebrating. But, but I think two things about that resonates with me. Number one, it was the sense of joy. And so I think that that out, that, that pouring out of joy, that was so, or organic just seemed for me to move the needle in terms of what was possible for our movements. We did not have a small win in, in, in November. That was a huge win. And it was huge in a many different ways in the actual tangible win itself, in the organizing capacity that we built in order to get there in the mobilizing capacity that we didn't need to use, um, but was, was in the wings and has been documented in the media. So I think that part of what we need to do is really think about what is our relationship with power um, and, and how is power actually actually not mutually exclusive with the future that we want to bring forward? And then how do we root that in the actual desired lived experience of people, which is not wanting to be sad and angry and outraged all the time, at least, you know, for, for me, um, and maybe I'm speaking for myself there, but, but to experience joy um, and abundance um, and rest so that we can um, just live good lives. I think that's, that's really the goal. I'm definitely hopeful. Um, everywhere I go, I see people who are trying, but I don't have false hope. I don't think we have a bigger movement than we do. There are huge, most of the country is unorganized. That is the truth of it. Um, so we need to like get into suburbs and smaller towns and even smaller cities where the organizing is not robust yet. Um, and, and we just need way more scale. So, you know, back in 1988, uh, Ethiopian immigrant in Portland, Oregon, where I lived at the time, was murdered by neo-Nazi skinheads, which was one of many, many violent acts that were going down at a time when neo-Nazi skinhead um, youth were surging. We looked at where are these groups actually recruiting from? What is the subculture that they're building their mo movement out of? And we made that subculture as complex to us as possible. We got to know the people and we went there. It was the alternative music scene in Portland and we started showing up at shows and even stage diving off the stage at shows after making big anti-racist proclamations. And it drew people to us 
who felt victimized and marginalized in the scene. And they formed two groups, Anti-Racist Action and Skinheads Against Racial Prejudice. And they turned out to be brilliant organizers because they knew exactly the context in which they needed to be organizing, the symbols they needed to wield, and the things they needed to do and say in order to win the day. And those young people broke the back of neo-Nazi skinhead organizing in the city of Portland. And so I think there are heroes everywhere, potentially. But we first have to be able to draw back the lens through which we generally see things, the blunt instruments with which we uh, organize people and categorize them and start to look for the complexity because it is everywhere and it's beautiful. Coming back to you, Adrian, but I have to say, when you talk about 42,000 conversations on chat, on, you know, in, in chat text messaging, and when you tell me how much people want to engage with one another, meaning with somebody they don't necessarily know and probably don't agree with, that gives me actually a taste. Oh my gosh, maybe we can avoid authoritarianism. Um, so thank you. I think you gave me my palpable moment of the day. We can't build it if we can't dream it. And this is about the dream of democracy and it is very much at risk. But I am always encouraged and, and particularly divorced from political party when people find a sense of their own power, when they come together to recognize that this is all in our self-interest, no one benefits except for those in power with white nationalism and white supremacy. And if we can get to that moment where we understand that we are collectively in this fight together and everything is at stake, be it climate, women's rights, voting rights, that's the promise, but it's one that we all hold collectively and will require each and every one of us. Well, I think it comes down exactly to that. And I want to thank you for participating in this conversation, everybody. I mean, along with our attention to civics, we need media that pulls back and looks at these stories and ideally helps us collectively dream up some alternatives um, that work for everyone. We will have this conversation again, I'm sure, but I've appreciated this one. Maybe it's because our conversation this time coincided with the run-up to the 20th anniversary of 9-11. But I thought a lot about our democratic system through the lens of what happened on that day. Look at the pictures of the attacks of 9-11, and you'd think it was one big national event that we all experienced in exactly the same way. But of course it wasn't. It was actually millions of different events experienced as individually as each of us is individual one from the next. So too with our democracy. It's not just election day and the result that emerges. We tend to think of it as a run-up, an event, and a result. But it's not. It's a process. And while our electoral system needs to be made as broad as possible so that everybody's vote counts and everybody feels inclined to participate, what I found so cheering about today's discussion was that pro-democracy activists are grappling with how to deepen the process, too. Yes, we need to make it wider, but we also need to go deep. And we need to invest not just in the results, but in the process and getting to know one another better, because we are all in this same boat. For more information on this week's guests, along with a suggested list of research and reading links to explore, go to our website. That's lauraflanders.org. We also invite you to watch the premiere of every week's episode on our YouTube channel every Sunday, 11.30 a.m. Participate in the live chat with me afterwards, along with my invited guests. All the details are at patreon.com forward slash the LF show, where we're kicking off our full fundraiser. The goal is to sign up 20 new monthly supporters by committing at least three or five dollars a month they'll be helping to keep this programming on the air and advertising free go to patreon.com forward slash the lf show to become one of our precious partners do your bit to keep this programming coming free to everyone you are the brick and mortar at the foundation of the laura flanders show and it's because of listeners like you that this show is currently available to over 200 million households on American public television, as well as radio. 
that's it from me this time. A big thanks to all of you, especially our Patreon partners, for taking the step and making the difference. Thanks in advance to all of you who join them at patreon.com forward slash the LF show. Stay kind, stay curious. I'm Laura.